Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Building Our World podcast. Today I had the pleasure of being joined by Enrico Foschi, the Director of Engineering at OLX Group in Berlin. Having risen the ranks in tech in Milan, Dublin and now Berlin, we go really in depth into his style of leadership, what makes a great leader, how to self-improve as a senior and also the psychological side to coaching and communicating with different people in your team. He was super honest about his journey and talked through how he worked on his weaknesses and his vulnerabilities over his career. A really fascinating discussion for anyone who wants to gain some insights into leadership and management at some of the highest levels. Enjoy. Enrico Foschi, welcome to the show. How are you doing on this fine Monday afternoon? And we're fantastic, Alex. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Based in London at the moment, it's uh, very cold. We're in the midst of a lockdown, but um, I think we're about two weeks away from uh, from coming out of it. How are things in Berlin? Uh, there is a bit of a soft lockdown, uh, but I would say today is actually a sunny day. I can see a blue sky, something that has been missing over the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so it's it's quite motivating and uh, starting to see some Christmas light around and so that's very nice. Are the Christmas markets still going to go ahead in Berlin, do you reckon? I think there are a couple of stands in and out, but the full Christmas market experience is, is not going to work, of course. Like we mm. want to keep people safe and uh, I think it's, it's the best that we don't actually have Christmas market this year. For how much we could be saddened by that because everybody loves them, but you know, safety first. Yeah, absolutely. They were they were so much fun though. Every time I always visited Berlin, try, trying to visit to Berlin uh, early December so I could do the Christmas markets. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we were just talking before. You are, and we're going to come on to all this stuff hopefully over the course of an hour if I keep on topic. But you are the the director of engineering at OLX Group in Berlin, very well known uh, and large tech company. Currently in charge of 14 tech teams, and that equates to around mm-hmm. 85 different people. So I, I wanted to find out first from you, as someone who's in charge and leads so many people, what do you think makes a good leader in this particular environment? Oh, well, jumping right to the tough questions, are we? <laughs> uh, what makes a good leader? Oh, God. Um, I think that... There are so many aspects. Uh, um, summarizing them into simple ones, I believe that a good leader is somebody who can inspire other people to um, to to uh, to work towards a common goal uh, together as a team with individual contribution um, and um, and move forward towards a direction that is well set and well identified uh, um, and ideally also well planned. So, so when you can inspire these, you also inspire people to grow. You you can understand what are the unique needs of your people, of your team, and you're able also to deliver on these for what your part is, and and they're able to deliver for each other for what their part as team player is. That this is what makes you a great orchestrator and a great leader. So, how does it work for for you in your situation with? I'm guessing, do you have sort of team leads or tech leads reporting into you who are then in charge of teams underneath them? Is that sort of the structure? Well, we have, um, at the moment, we have a layer of heads of engineering. So I have two heads of engineering that uh, we promoted from uh, the company, from an engineer manager position, and one that we are currently uh, recruiting for in uh, Poznan. And um, they, each one, handle about four to five packs and then each pack has an engineering manager a product manager and then they have the different people that are the best fit for that pack whether it is a front-end engineer full stack uh, data engineer sre or whatever it is so i'm sure maybe a lot of those software engineers or even people like from the outside because they're quite will be quite distant from you and what you do so it's quite easy to define, you know, what a software engineer does, what a lead developer does, even sort of an engineering manager. But when you get to that, like, director of engineering level, how would you say you define your role and, 
And what is it that you actually do that obviously adds value to, to the people underneath you? I would say that there are different aspects. So one, of course, is making sure that things do work and that you can be a safe reference point for people in terms of guidance and leadership on an engineering level. And then there are, of course, uh, other aspects about uh, understanding what is the company direction, what are the business core needs, uh, and being able to work, in my case, with together with the director of product, Zoltan, um, to actually deliver on those and, and, and orchestrate the pack and, and understand how each pack plays a role into this and, and a plan for the future for delivering on this part. This then is added on top of some soft skills that are required, like setting up an engineering culture and, and fostering engineering culture and and um, providing a safe space for people to um, uh, to express themselves and to grow, um, ensuring there is a, a personal development and growth for, for each individual in the company, coaching the more junior or even senior engineer managers and head of engineering growing into their roles, uh, connecting people between parks and departments uh, and, and a lot of other things. There's a, there's a lot to unpack there. One thing I would be interested to know is how do you tie in the business vision and the technical vision with the individual sort of aspirations of um, the software engineers or or the employees, because I think that's one of the hardest things to do sometimes is to, you know, in, in, a company and employee is like a deal, isn't it? You know, the, they give you their labor and um, in return you pay them, but also give them um, learnings and things like that. So, and it can be quite hard to communicate as well. So how would you tie in those individual needs of, of those tech teams and, and communicate the overall business vision to them? That's a really good question. I would say that um, everybody's working in the company because somehow they believe in what we're doing. And as OLX in the marketplace, we are helping fostering business opportunities for, for all sorts of people, for, for small uh, businesses to, to, to just any kind of consumer. Um, and when you believe in this, then you also have some sort of like implicit trust that you have uh, in um, uh, who is taking care of the business side uh, it could be a, from the managing director to, to all the people that actually work together with them to understand what are the needs of the customer. So our company is very customer-centric. Customers is always our priority. And everything starts from there eventually. So we find out, okay, what do uh, what are the main needs, the core needs of our customers? So let's, let's try to understand uh, where we can add value, where we can solve problems. Uh, and, and from these, translate it into where we can see each pack purposefully kind of like chip in and, and, and play their part. Regarding the needs of of the teams, each pack has, has some sort of like, as a mix of like hopes and desires of areas they can work on. We have, a, for example, we have a, an amazing search and, and relevance pack that is working on, um, on a set of texts that allow them to, to, to leverage more on uh, machine learning models and algorithm to, to predict what users may actually want to, uh, could be interested about. And, and obviously this is also like a mix, that it, it's something that is fantastic because it's a mix between what the business actually needs because, and, and this is something that when we nail uh, actually delivers a lot of value and what the tech team actually wants to work on because it's exciting, because it's new and, and because it's purposeful. In another situation, you have maybe some more integrity work that needs to be done, like trying to um, take some piece of the platform away from a legacy system and into a new system. And, and maybe some of this work is not as exciting, but at the same time, it's something that is required for us as an investment into the future. So as long as there is purpose, back to the original answer, and as long as everybody can see that their own contribution is actually delivering some sort of uh, value or investment or solving problems to users, uh, then this does fit the need with the kind of people that we hire. It's so interesting because obviously <laughs> my pretty much my whole job is speaking to software engineers who want to leave their, their companies. And it <laughs> can be for a whole host of reasons. But there's a few things that always come up. Um, and that is no use of or 
how should I say this? They're not using the the most modern technologies to keep them up to date, and they, mm-hmm. they want to move for that. Um, you know, usual stuff like working culture and pay as well. Um, but one thing that seems to come up a lot, and I don't know whether it's because Berlin is is home to hyper growth, but there's been a lot of cases where they will work on something, and it won't even get released, or they'll have to switch projects and. They've been working on something for like three, three weeks or, or a month, and then there's a decision from the top, and they goes, you know, scrap that project. We're going in this direction now, and they're constantly shifting. Uh, that seems to be um, a, a reason that comes up a lot. I'm guessing that from from what you've just said, that that would never happen at OLX. But is is that something you're ever aware of? Oh no, of course it does happen in OLX. It happens in every single company. I will be lying otherwise. Um, it's 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 not about. I think it's impossible to avoid this situation, to be fair. Like um, managing change is one of the most difficult things. Uh, it feels that sometimes we're playing poker and uh, we can decide whether to keep investing or to just uh, call it a hand and fold uh, and call it a, a, a loss and a waste in some ways. Why, what is the biggest waste? It's not as the fact that we have been, just the fact that we've been investing time and people into working on something that will never be released because you can question, of course, that the learning that has gone into that. Um, but more about the fact that um, what we, uh, every time you introduce change, you introduce a disruption. And the disruption, um, first of all, cuts off the investment that everybody was chipping in to see a purposeful result. And again, I am a strong believer that purpose in terms of solving problems and delivering value is what motivates people most. So when people work on a long term for a feature, um, they are investing time and energy because they want to see the purpose delivery at the end. So when there is a change on that and this doesn't happen, of course, we, we cut off the investment and we call it a loss for everybody. Plus the disruption is actually going to add a little bit of uh, mistrust into whatever next thing you're going to be working on because uh, you are going to be a little bit afraid to put in the same level of commitment some more given the fact that these things may change as well. So it does not only bring a, a very high cost uh, to cut things and to change things uh, at the moment, but also brings a very high cost actually that needs to be paid off in very in, in many installments in the future. I think that these things is unavoidable and communication here is key for making things happen. I mean, employee, company is a relationship like any relationship, open communication, vulnerability on both sides and it can be vulnerability also on the on the leadership side saying hey we actually we actually screwed up we thought that he was like this but we missed up this point and we need to all make a decision that we know is a big cost but it's the best decision that we can make at the moment the other otherwise going ahead this direction will actually bring the company down to a worse path in the future so i think that when the communication is there, is open and is honest and, and, and is trustful, then this will not help maybe with the, the emotion that will come up out of losing something because these are just natural human emotions, but it will come up with a trust that will not be hindered by um, uh, by what happened, especially if this comes also with uh, this is why this happened and this is what we will do to make sure that it will not happen again. This is a very critical component. And again, comparing employing company to actual relationship when you have, uh, when, when you're making mistakes, when uh, something happens with your partner, how um, uh, you, you tend to apologize and then you say, okay, I will not do it again. This is what, uh, why I learned that this affected you or why this hurt you or whatever. And uh, I will make sure that this will not happen again. And when this communication comes from a company, then the trust can still be there. And then, of course, if the same thing happens and happens and happens without some sort of follow up, then of course, like trust is hindered as well. Mm. well. It's amazing how how many companies don't follow that sort of line of of communication. I often think that you know most companies and, and most board directors and and everything like that, when you hear about these these projects being pulled or things going badly wrong or mismanaged, they're not like bad people trying to do bad things, but the communication and the messaging is is so so important um and can be so easily done you see the same in politics as well you know it's most governments probably on the whole are trying to do their best to do good policies but their messaging and the way they 
sort of set their tone for example as um means that yeah. you know that they're, they're definitely portrayed in in a bad way so uh, one but thing politics that is a bit different in politics if somebody says we actually screwed up i'm sorry about this this would be heavily used against them because it's always a race it's always a competition um in companies the moment you don't do this then you're gonna get uh, you're actually gonna get the worst because uh, yeah. and it's difficult i mean it's many many leaders don't go down this path because this is really really difficult communication and and it, it requires that you as a leader need to be okay with being vulnerable and that's where strength comes also from being okay with your vulnerabilities and with your openness to your people so coming on to that how because you are so senior with within the company how are you becoming like a better version of yourself how are you because it is quite easy even if if you're being self-reflective to to think everything you're doing is you know is going well and and you you can be blindsided by things so how are you self-reflecting and almost trying to get feedback from other people within the business because you're the one constantly probably giving feedback to a lot of people so for you yourself where's your feedback coming from for for you to become a better version of yourself uh, in your position i think uh, there is a lot of humbleness that needs to come at play um personally i know that i have a lot of areas that were i need to improve a lot of areas where i've improved in the past and um it's 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 about like First of all, accepting that you are in this position means you have a responsibility. You you can deliver in this position, or you may not. Just like, like work really hard to make sure that you can. Um, but also, it doesn't mean that you are in this position because you are better than other people necessarily. Um, you can be uh, on, on many levels. Other people may be way better off than you, and anybody can teach you something. And keeping this approach is what helps you not fall back into bad patterns or. Um, or fostering your unconscious bias that uh, with authority it may come in as well like I've seen people going through the imposter syndrome um, and people going through the uh, uh, authority unconscious bias where, where there is this belief that the higher the authority you have the more right you tend to be uh, and those are equally very dangerous in leadership so personally it's a path it's a constant path it's a path of const- constant growth and um, what helps for me is understanding what are my core values um, and setting my boundaries and acting about my core values and making sure that uh, I am fair to myself and I'm fair to the people around me. And um, and accepting the fact that my core values sometimes may not match the company, may not match the team, may not match the situation, but as long as I act by what I believe makes me being a consistent person and leader, then I can work on my brand, I can work on my persona, I can work on the way I work with people. Um, issues come when I start to be a messenger of other people's ideas or communications or when I start to, to uh, go into a pleasing mode of people that may not be happy or um, or just go into the, the authoritative mode of just forcing people to do things. That's not going to be uh, something that helps me grow, actually just the opposite. And I encourage everybody constantly to give me feedback. Also, there are many systems that companies like OLX have that allow people to provide anonymous feedback that um, is relayed and in a very uh, anonymous way. Like only if you get at least three people from your team to give anonymous feedback, then you can see the consolidated feedback is relayed in different ways to, to managers with the support of HR and so on so that we actually get to know these things. But at the same time, I would love to see a place where anything that is written in these anonymous forms uh, is also safely shared directly to me. Um, not because I want to know who is the person that says this thing, but because uh, I want the person that feels anything neg- negative towards me to to feel safe into this feeling of like, okay, I just want to tell you that this behavior that you're having, Enrico, it just sucks. It's not great. It makes me feel like that. And then, of course, it's up to me to actually see how I get how I get perceived, and then use that feedback as introspection of whether this is something that I accept as a part of myself, as a part of my values, or is something that uh, is just maybe my personality. And my personality, in some situation, may end up not fitting with somebody else. So, it, it, and it's it's not necessarily a, a, an easy process, but it's something that has always been rewarding, uh, um, proportional to the effort that you put in. 
But that is so difficult in practice, isn't it? Because if you've been working with someone for a long time and all of a sudden they come to you with a personality trait you have or there's been certain things that you've been doing, it can be quite hard to take. You know, we, we're we all humans. Um, you know, we've all got an ego, whether we like it or not. So is that something you've had to work on or is there anything that you've done to maybe handle those situations better? Oh, no, of course, yeah. Um, I think that uh, I've been going through a path of, 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 of cost of improvement and uh, I started leading teams when I was 19. I was very unequipped at that point. At that point, I was actually the kind of uh, um, manager and boss that was using uh, authorities to drag people to get things done. Of course, I hope, luckily I always assumed that purpose was delivering motivation. But at the same time, when it is about engagement and improving yourself, if you don't open yourself up for feedback, then, then this is not going to help you. So the ego, usually a strong ego, usually comes up also with a strong insecurity. And that's what was very predominant at the very early phases of my leadership career. Uh, this strong insecurity then shifted the... Um, the authoritative style leadership, like I am your boss, so you do, as, as I said, it is terrible, to towards, uh, should I be your boss? Am I entitled to be your boss? To some sort of like strong imposter syndrome. And then eventually like realizing, well, let's look back at experience of everything that has been done. And well, actually, that kind of makes sense. I'm having a proper self-worth, self-esteem now. I believe that I'm in the right position. Let me deliver on that. Uh, but it took a hell of a lot of time and in years to get to this point so so the ego is always there especially with with promotions it comes this sort of like a dynamic in a company where even when you you would never want this to be the case people around you will treat you differently um i have to be very careful these days even in olx and it is a very flat hierarchical company um in a way, I express my opinions or in a way I, I question things, in a way I ask for, for information because it doesn't come from me as an ex-engineer or whatever. It comes from me as, as the director. And, 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 and so, so it almost comes with a questioning, almost comes with a bias of, of, of a strong weighted opinion that other people feel maybe not as confident to, 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 to discuss, to debate. Um, so, so you, you just need to be really, really careful in these moments and, and not just be aware of, of of your ego, but also of the perceived ego that other people have of you because of your authority. It's so fascinating. And you mentioned what happened in your in your 20s as well, because a lot of people, and I can kind of relate to this in a way from, from my previous job when I sort of rose up the ranks and entered into management really quickly. If you have a certain amount of success in your career, you don't you, you in a in a weird way you kind of stop chasing and you stop trying to looking at the ladder like looking upwards. It's very well, it's very easy to do that, and all of a sudden you're in a place where you have got a bit of success and some authority and management that you're doing well, and you're trying to hold on to it, and you almost go into like a a losing mentality where you're not trying to gain anymore. You're trying to to hold on to, you know, the status you have within a company. And I think for a lot of young people who enter into management, and I think I'll definitely count myself in that, although it wasn't that long ago. Um, it's definitely something that people aren't aware of. Um, yeah, I believe so. And, but, but the interesting part that I tend to believe now is that this is not like, Oh, this is something that I used to do and 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 now I'm so much better off. I think that these are states, personality states that we have. And uh, we we are like unlikely to get rid of them in the long term. We're likely gonna always have to deal with them in our life because I mean if you look also at the um in the humanitarian branch of psychology, it kind of like teaches you that these states have been settled themselves in in the first four to six years of life. Um, so for us, it's about understanding and being self-aware first of these states and why, 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 why we feel this way, why we feel insecure, why we feel this ego just driving our reactions. Um, and, and then being aware of 
how to actually react to these and how to let our states control our emotions and our reactions and how to be ourselves rationally driving things. Um, because it will happen again during, it happens to me again from time to time, there is that day where your mood are particularly low or something on the side of work happened that just drains your energy. Um, it will just happen again that these things will come up. That you will still have the imposter syndrome. You will still have a little bit of ego. You will still have all of these things. And I believe that the important thing is about uh, not avoiding these things, but making sure that you can actually deal with these things, uh, understand where these things are in the way, and understands where um, um, you, why you maybe are taking things and perceiving things in a way that is not necessarily the way things are. Um, so when you are aware of your emotions in that moment, then you can also like better understand uh, how, um, why you are perceiving things, why you're communicating in a certain way, maybe even being perceived in a certain way. But if you were going more, more into the branch of psychology now than <laughs> engineering leadership. Oh, I love psychology. I think, it's in, I think it's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. It, what you say about being aware of stuff, that's very big in mindfulness and, and meditation isn't, isn't it um i'm not like a big meditator i probably should do more but the one thing they say is that you know don't try to stop thinking about stuff don't try and shut things down and anxieties down or, or anything like that just see the thoughts visualize the thoughts be aware of it and just kind of accept it and let it kind of run through um and i think that's kind of what you were alluding to just then as well yeah i mean anxiety is a powerful tool i mean of course like some people have some very strong chemical induced anxieties that it's very hard to live by um but anxiety can be sometimes uh, for uh, for many people a powerful tool so you have an anxiety your body is telling you something and it may be telling you something because there is a trigger in the past because that person in your team said uh, something that made you look uh, in a way you believe maybe it's not up to your standards to other people. And um, uh, and anxiety is telling you, hey, this is, this is wrong. So so at this point, uh, you uh, can get into the spiral of anxiety. So that means self-realizing that you're getting anxious, not wanting to be seen as anxious by the people. You're getting more and more insecure and anxiety increases. And you may end up having full-blown panic attack in these cases. Or, or actually say, hey, I'm anxious. It's it's okay. It's my body is trying to tell me something. I don't really know what it is right now. I believe I'm going to um, understand this later, maybe. Or maybe I don't know if he keeps repeating. I'm even talking to a professional about this. I'm not sure. But this is something that uh, um, is there, as you said. And uh, you can think about like having a, um, a football and then just pushing this football underwater. And if you push the football underwater and like, the thing where you will push your anxiety is away, first of all, is is draining energy from you. And second, eventually, when you get tired, this football will jump up in an explosive set of reactions that you don't want to have. And as a leader, as a person that deals with people and is supposed to drive people and, and lead people, you don't have to be perfect. You're going to have all of these problems. And you're going to mess up many times. But you need to put a focus on self-improvements on self-awareness, on self-esteem, on uh, um, being able to understand and better react to your emotional states so that your team can then benefit from this. Not only your team, it's actually everybody around you, but that's the best, one of the best things I realized about um, being, when, when I went into management, is that any growth in management actually became a, a natural growth in life rather than when I was a, an engineer and coder and just learning a new tech or mastering something different in, uh, in technology was not necessarily helping me with my relationships. So you talk about understanding yourself and being self-reflective on yourself. One thing about being a manager is you have to understand other people. You have to understand your team, but personalities can be so different. It's like the old football for the football manager analogy. You know, do you, if someone has a bad performance, you know, do you go for them and tell them to, to you know, to up their game or do you put an arm around them, you know? Or so I'd, it's hard to put it in terms for, for you, but say, I don't know, a, a software engineer produces not a great piece of work. You know, do you go after them or do you, you know, bring them in and say, this wasn't good enough? 
is everything okay? Is everything okay at, in your life or everything like that? Do you do you tend to try to approach things differently with different people? I I think it's kind of a must. I'm, I'm not sure if I intend to, but it comes kind of naturally. I would talk to my partner in a different way. I would talk to um, to a friend in a different way. I would talk to a colleague. And, and and it's not just about relationship status; it's also about the kind of person that they are. Um, with some people, and this is not maybe something that gets right the first time, but comes after a relationship is being built. It takes months. But with some people, they they need more of somebody that basically tells them, "Hey, stop it! You actually have everything you you need to, to get these things to success. So just please." stop whatever you're doing now, stand up and get this done. And, and they need a little bit of a harsh approach on these things. Other people need to be sharing first a little bit more about what are they, what are the issues and they need more of a pat on the back approach uh, where the thing that is very dangerous with the pat on the back is that you don't want to enter into an independent relationship where they always somehow need this sort of encouragement. So, Eventually, I'm a strong believer that people need to start believing in themselves to be able to actually perform. And this belief needs to come from themselves. You can you can help them in this. You can help them untap this potential within themselves. Uh, but you cannot provide this yourself. If they come to you asking for um, uh, safety, asking for a reassurance of their worth, uh, maybe it's okay one time but when this becomes a pattern that you become uh, you you you're, you're entering into a dependable relationship uh, and that makes them not performing well unless you keep giving this thing um so i think that i believe that your your job here is being able to untap their potential and their ability to believe in themselves and being able to deliver and that's why purpose is so important when when you realize that uh, you empower people to be responsible and to be delivering according to uh, their own abilities then you basically are you're empowering and you're resonating potentials all around your team. Do you think there's anything that we could do to identify those sorts of traits in a hiring process? Because you want people to join who are going to have autonomy, can take on a lot of knowledge very quickly and you know, learn from themselves and not be dependable. It, in your experience, has, has there been anything you've seen during sort of hiring processes, I'm sure you've been involved in in plenty, that have turned out that those people have joined and, and had those traits? Is there anything you look out for in particular? I wouldn't make this a general um, objective rule. I personally, this could also be a bias on myself, but I personally prefer to work with people who show a lot of proactiveness in the in the interview process. When I interview people, I tend to um, I tend to basically leave out options so that they can present themselves in the interview with a minimum amount of preparation required, or they come extremely well prepared on uh, what the position is, how the company is working, um, some of them came even with the presentations, presenting themselves. I remember I used to ask a very basic question um, in the past to some candidates for a head of engineering position, like, what can you tell me about the structures? And then present this to me like in the next round of interview. And some of them were coming and just replying at two lines explanation they were finding on on a textbook and other people were just uh, giving us a full presentation on what the structures are what is the difference between python 3.5 and 3.6 and data structures processing and, and then all of these um, uh, detailed uh, nerdy uh, passionate uh, um, parts of the conversation that actually made it look like they actually were passionate about what they were presenting they were motivated about what they were doing and they were looking for a place where this passion could be fostered into actual uh, purposeful commitment. Um, and when I see this, this is something that really gets me and, and really tend to reward these people. Um, and then really it's, it's, it's for me, it's also about the fact of how much these people, how, how, how much a candidate puts themselves as a, as a center of focus. Um, and how they dealt with conflict in the past, how, what kind of conflict they had, 
how they dealt and uh, how they with them and how what they did to prevent these things from happening again. Um, you can hear the textbook thing about somebody having to pacify other two people, but you sometimes tend to be hearing also some person not being afraid of showing a vulnerability and saying, actually, this is what I did in the past. Um, there was a part of me and a part of the other person. In my part, I actually did these things. This was a behavior I was not happy with, and I worked on myself to actually change it. And, uh, and I believe that this thing did not happen again. I don't think it will happen again because of X, Y, and Z. And there is obviously a little bit of um, uh, genuinity that you can always spot during a conversation to see whether somebody is just tricking you or not. When it comes to the technical side of things, then, away from the personality side of things, what do you think makes an incredible software engineer? And I'll couple onto that. How much value does it bring to a company, to you, when you have an amazing software engineer in your team or a, an amazing group of software engineers? How much difference does it make? Because as a recruiter, obviously I work and build tech teams uh, for, for people. But sometimes being on the agency side, it's one of the downsides of being agency is that it's really hard to really see the impact and to feel the impact and to get that sort of tangible, um, see those tangible results. So yeah, what, what makes an incredible software engineer and, and how much value does it bring to you in your role when you have a group of them? I believe one of the most important skills that I look at people, um, of course, like going beyond the, you can actually code, you can actually get the task done. That is a bit of a, more of a check, a basic check rather than the main driver, um, is how well of team players they are. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of research that showed, uh, on a very big one from Google as well, that the most performing teams are the ones that have a safe space. Um, in them and the safe space is coming from uh, being able to accept the diversity of each one of us and being able to include everybody in uh, the conversation. So, so the most important skill that an engineer or any member of the team needs to bring to the table is 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 basically embody these uh, diversity and inclusion uh, um, skills that allow this person to be a great contribution to the team and not just somebody that could be the best amazing genius, but just that nobody wants to work with. Because this is not going to really help uh, anything beyond the two people startup. Um, so being able to work with the team, and then of course, like there needs to be a passion for what you're doing. There needs to be a mix between a healthy passion for um, the kind of work that you're doing, that uh, the, the kind of like tech that you're using, uh, but also an interest for, for, for trying and pursuing uh, with curiosity, uh, new horizons and, and getting out of the comfort zone on on, on your tech and getting into um, an exploration area where you can actually learn, develop new skills and, and also use them regardless whether these were maybe something that you wanted or not. Because sometimes most of the things that we tend to like the most are the ones that we didn't even realize that we wanted. So sometimes the things that we need are not necessarily the ones that we want. And we need some some external factor, um, whether it is the company needing you to try new tech uh, or or to get something done that nobody else can. And, and um, sometimes we need this new contribution to actually being able to push us away from the comfort zone and actually getting into, oh, I need to learn this. And actually I may end up lacking this a lot. Or if not, I may just be able to get some learning out of it. And and I use my curiosity to, to still make this a pleasant experience. And then I can teach this to other people as well. And I can share and I can play within my team to make sure that this is not just something that I keep to myself egoistically and selfishly, but it's something that I can uh, help uh, and make a big contribution to the company. So um, these kind of people are the ones that I believe could be some of the best engineers that we have. One thing we haven't covered yet, I realize we're like, God, time flies. We're like 40 minutes in. Um, I wanted to come back to your kind of background itself. So how did you actually end up in tech in, in the first place? I believe that, uh, that if I have to be honest speaking, I ended up in tech when I was started uh, when coding on, on basic when I was 10 or 12, I can't remember, mostly because my brother was teaching me how to do it. I 
didn't have any any game any console and the only way to play was to to record all these games that I was finding in the big old uh, computer guides uh, uh, line by line into the um, uh, ZX Spectrum or uh, or Basic and just play on these games that I was able to call myself. Um, so so and then it was like wow I can actually create things and you know as a as a kid, this is fantastic. It's, it's it's not as different from Lego. Back then, though, it must have been so rare to have that curiosity to code. Obviously, you said your your brother taught you. But even now, coding is much more... I don't even want to use the word mainstream because it's not. I think 0.3% of the world world's population can code. But it, back then, it must it, was it quite a rare thing for someone to do at that age? I think it was very geeky. My brother was extremely geek at that time and I was very lucky for that um, and I was very lucky for the fact that my brother at nine years old uh, has a very fatherly approach towards me so he wanted to share things with me he wanted to teach me things I, I don't think that without him uh, I would be where I am right now so I think it's been uh, it is like a huge huge luck factor on my side and then from there was it computer science you studied at university Actually, no. Uh, I ended up doing mechanical engineering as uh, in Italy. I mean, yeah. uh, at that time, I looked at the, all the courses in computer science, uh, and uh, there was really little uh, for the way courses were structured in Italy, North Italy, uh, that I could learn uh, that I didn't know already, and I saw that to be potentially wasted. So I started uh, taking over a mechanical engineering course that uh, one and a half years in. Uh, I actually dropped because of uh, I had my own company that was going pretty well. So I had to continue to make a decision of whether I continue working on my company or I continue my studies and close my company. I couldn't manage to do both things at the same time. The, both of them were very demanding. And uh, yeah, I made a decision that eventually got me where I am now. So I so saw you, you went over to Dublin and that's where you first got into sort of tech leadership. Um, actually, oh, yes. I started leading a team in Italy with, uh, when my company was somehow incorporated into an advertising uh, um, corporations, oh, okay. uh, and uh, I had to create the first digital team in this advertising company, focusing on TV and offline advertising uh, and going into web advertising, uh, web projects. Uh, um, so I had to create the first digital team, and uh, that's where I was 21 with a team of 15 people, some of them uh, uh, twice as old as me as I was, and... Uh, um, that was a very awkward situation for me, I have to say, but where I had to go with uh, pushing my confidence quite a lot to actually survive. Then I went to Dublin uh, one year after where I stayed for seven years, uh, worked in different um, environments from startups to to some corps like Microsoft and, and Bank of America. And, and after that, then I um, fast tracking came to Germany where I worked mostly in the marketplaces like um, Rocket Internet and a startup called the Gino for almost four years uh, and now here in uh, Olex. You first, you, your first role in Berlin was Rocket Internet. Correct. From what I could see, yeah. That must have been quite a big deal then because they were, was that like 2015? Mm-hmm. And they were, there weren't many companies, well, they were just starting to come up maybe, but Berlin Tech was still a pretty small place, I'd say, in 2015. How, how, what was the draw to Berlin, and and how have you seen it change over the last few years? Um, I think I just wanted to change environments. I got um, in uh, Ireland, everything was going fantastically smooth. I was having a great career in Bank of America, and I was not expecting to have that um, because I was planning to go to San Francisco, but the company that I just joined, I lost a round of funding, so I had to cancel all the hires, and I found myself stuck in Ireland, uh, where I took this uh, interim job in Bank of America. Um, so I decided to go back to the startup scene, but also like to travel a little bit more and get to know a little bit more countries in Europe. So Germany and Berlin looked like to be a good candidate, and the Rocket Internet was adding interim CTOs at that point for their small uh, companies that they were constantly incubating and, and uh, fabricating. And um, and yeah, so basically started uh, uh, started there where I stayed for five months uh, where things changed quite a bit at that time. Uh, they, it was the time where Rocket Internet transformed itself from a, um, a company factory to uh, 
supporter of Zalando and at the times for Panda, and that was not really what I wanted to join uh, in January. So that's also why I decided that it was not the place where I wanted my probation to continue. <laughs> okay. Um, I know you're pretty busy, so we will wrap up very, very soon. But there was one thing that I wanted to, I wanted to pick your brains on because there'll be a lot of software engineers listening to this or like even um, engineering managers or directors of engineering themselves. So what sort of one or two bits of advice would you give to someone who is aspiring to be in your shoes in the, in the future? Um, I would say don't aspire to be in my shoes. <laughs> uh, aspire to be in... Uh... <laughs> Loads of people say that, actually. <laughs> they say, don't, don't bother. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not don't bother. It's not because it's a tough job or whatever it is. I mean, I, I'm here because... I coincidentally found a fit with uh, what I really like. So aspire to be in uh, what you feel fit best with your values. And you will not know what that will be in five years, in 10 years' time, in 15 years, 15 years' time. Just spend a little bit of time really to understand what are your values? What do you treasure? What are the things that you did in the last five years that made you really excited, that made you really love to work on personal projects or in your office or whatever it is? And, and then try to shape your career in the current company where you are or outside of it in a way that the next step is more next to that path, more next to your values and try to take incremental small steps in a, in agile fashion, always more and more and more towards your path. Um, don't believe that uh, there is a, an end goal because the end goal will keep shifting. The only, the only thing that people will likely know or try to know is, is what is the next checkpoint. Fascinating. Well, Enrico, thank you so much for your time. I know uh, you're very busy and you've got lots of stuff ahead. So we got so much value from from yourself. I loved getting into the mechanics and the psychology of leadership and motivating people and how to become a better leader yourself. I think that's really fascinating. And um, the psychology behind that is, is so interesting. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for your time, Alex thank you so much for listening to the building our world podcast to show your support and to stay up to date then be sure to hit that subscribe button until then i'll see you next time bye-bye